As you know, through our commitment statements, the North Carolina Black Alliance believes that everyone should have access to health care in time of injury or illness. We understand that in low wealth communities, especially in communities of color, there is a great, a greater hurdle to not only accessing health care, but quality of care. The access to health care program focuses on addressing racial health disparities in communities that are not reached by the traditional health care system and elevating the voices, perspectives, um, of the voices and perspectives of these com communities to our black elected officials. Our particular programming prioritizes the unique needs of black communities in rural Eastern North Carolina. The work in this program area aims to create a more informed electorate through community education on race and health equity that can ultimately lead us to policies that positively impact those drivers of quality health. So next, what you'll hear is a conversation between Deputy Director Marcus Bass and Program Coordinator Corita Giddings as they discuss the new program in this area for the NCBA. In America, over 50% of all people of color in this nation live only two miles away from a toxic waste site. In North Carolina, we are number one in the nation for PFAS contamination. When we talk about the lead piping in our children's schools and the mold and mildew that dots the hallways, when we talk about affordable housing must also be fair housing, must also be clean housing, that is environmental justice. When we talk about utilities, is a human rights because everyone deserves to have the lights on. Everyone deserves affordable energy so they can run their CPAP machines for oxygen or their nebulizers for asthma. Utilities is a human right. Clean air is a human right. Clean water is a human right. Healthy food and access to health care is a human right. At the North Carolina Black Alliance, we have prioritized environmental justice as a key issue area for our communities because we understand cumulative impact is burdens of layer on the backs of our people. But we cannot do this work without first giving honor to the elders and the ancestors of the Warren County, North Carolina protest that birthed the environmental justice movement that is now nationally and globally a phenomenon to protect marginalized communities. like to welcome everybody to this very special segment of the North Carolina Black Summit virtual experience. My name is Marcus Bass. I have the pleasure of serving as Deputy Director for the North Carolina Black Alliance. And it's my pleasure to introduce to you all today, Karita Giddings, Program Coordinator for our Access to Healthcare Program for the North Carolina Black Alliance. As many as you know, the North Carolina Black Alliance works to engage around a number of commitments. And you as members, have helped us craft these commitment statements. Well, none are more important in this moment of pandemic than healthcare. Um, we know that healthcare costs are rising. Uh, the contribution that the state is supposed to make by, on behalf of the federal government has not risen uh, to the level of Medicaid expansion that we've seen in other parts of the country. And we've been committed to making sure that our residents across North Carolina have access to healthcare and information. Uh, and so, Karita, welcome. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of the North Carolina Black Alliance, our team, our board of directors and staff, and our members. And I uh, just want to first give you the floor to uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, your experience, and what brings you here uh, to the virtual experience of the North Carolina Black Summit. Sure. So thank you for that introduction. Um, my name is Karita Giddings, like Marcus said. Um, I am a native of Winston-Salem, North Carolina. I got my bachelor's degree in political science from UNC Chapel Hill. Um, and then I went to get my master's in global affairs with a concentration in human rights from New York University. Um, so I've always had this interest, this focus on human rights issues, but particularly in the United States. 
Um, and so after I finished my master's degree, um, I had some time to work in the uh, General Assembly, um, which really gave me some insight onto the uh, legislative and political workings in North Carolina. And that opened the door for me to um, join the North Carolina Black Alliance, um, focusing on access to health care as a social justice, as a human rights issue, um, and in an ideal time where we're looking and seeing that Black communities, um, their issues with access to care, how their environments affected them um, in the pandemic were exacerbated um, from what they were already experiencing. So I was happy to um, join the team and kind of be a part of this very exciting work at a very timely moment. And, and we thank you for all that you are doing. Um, for a lot of individuals, when they think about healthcare, they think about the end product, right? They think about um, a hospital being provided in community or a community health center. But the role that you're in uh, kind of involves itself on multiple levels. And I think one of the experiences that you've had is uh, understanding uh, how to navigate policy. Um, when it comes down to uh, policy in North Carolina and healthcare, Talk a little bit about um, it, where we've been, at, at least in the immediate few years, in the General Assembly kind of debating health care. What is this really about? Because it would seem as if, you know, these federal dollars have been here since, uh, you know, to, since the Obama administration. And we have failed to engage in something that's very simply helping millions of Americans. It could help millions more in North Carolina. But it's tied up in this wonky uh, legislative battle that's not really about um, you know, uh, uh, for a lot of folks, our bread and butter issue. So talk to us a little bit about the the politics of the policy side of this debate. So in North Carolina with healthcare, with looking to see if we're gonna do Medicaid expansion, one of the things we've really been seeing is that it's not so much about um, what expanding Medicaid and extending access to healthcare, for um, millions of people that fall in the coverage gap, but it's more so about the message that it sends um, that North Carolina is expanding healthcare to, um, to people who can't afford it, maybe for some in our General Assembly, um, that's too liberal, if that's how you want to call it. Um, and so I know the leadership that we currently have, um, people are worried about the message that it sends that we want to ensure um, the 600,000 plus that are in the coverage gap, um, the people who are being affected by redetermination each year, but wouldn't so much fall in the gap if North Carolina were to fully expand Medicaid um, for those who fall in and out of the coverage gap when their income changes, when redetermination comes. Um, and so really here in North Carolina, it's just been about the image or what the uh, what the outlook, not so much as the care that people are getting, um, but more so just the appearance of the politics and the policy and what that says for each side in the General Assembly. That's, that's a very interesting point, what it looks like. Um, there have been conversations about aid and relief, especially in this moment of pandemic, uh, and the stopping of a lot of aid and relief comes down to what uh, folks' opinion is are individuals that need care the most, need help the most. But I think this issue of health care, you've explained it very directly, it impacts more than just Black residents. The individuals that uh, need access to health care in this moment, especially when we talk about the rural parts of our state, in the northeastern and southeastern parts of our state, there are communities that desperately need uh, these opportunities to have uh, closer proximity to resources to get them the better determinants of health. Uh, and that's a, a huge word that we've heard uh, across the board, social determinants of health. Uh, if you could, Karita, talk to us a little bit about what that means per se. And then I want to more so figure out, especially for our local elected officials and for other individuals, uh, how we use this phrase social determinants of health is not just about uh, hospitals. It's about more than just, you know, one piece. So let's kind of focus on this social determinants of health conversation real quick. So the social determinants of health, it really just refers to um, your lived environment, your social, your economic factors um, that affect your health and the way that you are able to take care of yourself. So if you are lacking income or have minimal income, maybe you're not able to afford your regular visits. Um, maybe it's not a priority on your list of things you need to do because you're worried about making sure that ends meet. 
Um, you also have issues like transportation. Um, when people can't uh, get themselves to the hospital, to their doctors for regular care, they're, they're gonna miss appointments. Um, they're not gonna take care of themselves um, in the way that people who have regular access to transportation, whether it's by a car or their, um, there's transit routes um, in the area near where they live. Um, and then you also have to think about, um, of course, our hospitals, but also how some places, um, 60 miles looks different to the hospital, right? So if you're living in rural North Carolina, um, 60 miles could be 90 minutes, whereas when um, you live in maybe a more metro area, 60 miles is just straight highway, and it's 60 minutes, um, and you're not dealing with winding roads or maybe um, dirt roads, con um, gravel roads. Um, so there's all those different factors that affect um, people first being able to just get to the facilities where care is being offered. Um, and then also people being able to afford those services. Um, what good does it do you if you can get to a hospital, but you can't afford the care or you don't wanna run the risk of putting yourself in medical debt, which then has other consequences for things that you're able to do, the way you're able to take care of yourself, your family and your other financial responsibilities. So you have to take into account all of those different things when you're thinking about how people are able to take care of themselves accessing healthcare. Um, and then also, I think as it relates to our communities, to Black communities, we have to think about, are there even people that look like us that are providing the care? Because if you don't feel comfortable um, going to the doctor, you're not going to. Um, and I know a lot of people in the access to healthcare work, they talk about how mirror, mirror, when you see someone who looks like, Lee, looks like you, you feel more comfortable going to get that care, interacting with that person, speaking with that person. And so another component I would say for Black communities within the scope of social determinants of health is having more providers of color, people that look like you to make them feel more comfortable to even go to seek care um, in the first place. That's, that's powerful. Um, I think a lot of times in this conversation, we get so bogged down about the health conditions of our community, um, high blood pressure, you know, ind individuals that have uh, other, you know, situations or ailments that we forget the root cause, right? And I think when you talk about how long it takes to get to a hospital in certain communities or uh, the lack of healthy food in certain communities, access is a big part of health. And I think it's very important, especially for our attendees of uh, the virtual experience of the North Carolina Black Summit to recognize that when we are talking about Medicaid expansion and this opportunity to invest fully in healthcare for communities that have not had access, we're not just talking about standing up hospitals. Um, we're talking about standing up an entire system um, from transportation to education to uh, all different facets uh, will be provided resources uh, through Medicaid expansion. And it, it goes kind of goes back to exactly what you were saying earlier, Karita, um, for individuals that see uh, or don't want to see communities grow, uh, there's vested and valued interest in making sure the individuals stay on pills, making sure the individuals stay in, you know, these other situations where they're more dependent on uh, the corporate prospects and actual, you know, real social determinants of health, healthier outcomes is what we want to see invested in. And that doesn't always meet the bottom line of corporations, which is for another panel discussion, but I think it's very important. Uh, there is something that you mentioned, Karita, that I want to really uh, talk about, this mirror, mirror um, piece. And especially when we are talking about recruitment of individuals to work in healthcare, just like in education, it helps to see individuals that look like you have a lived experience. But in a lot of cases, especially in health, um, we're seeing a space where there's not a lot of individuals that look like the black and brown communities that they serve. Uh, I think about a lot of mothers right now in the pandemic. Um, we see a lot of pandemic babies. I myself uh, have a, a 14 month old that was born in the middle of the pandemic and seeing um, how the hospital uh, treats uh, patients in any situation uh, needs more attention. But especially when we talk about communities of color and underrepresented communities in the hospital, that environment can be very uh, dangerous for a lot of women. Can we talk a little bit about um, not just maternal health, but about women's health in general and, and how important that is in this moment um, as we are growing into this space around access to healthcare? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, as I was thinking about, you know, 
maternal health, Black maternal health, women's health, kind of within the larger scope of access to healthcare, um, it really stood out as being a separate um, piece, a separate issue that we should be focusing on, primarily because North Carolina um, is a top 10 state, unfortunately, in um, Black maternal uh, or maternal mortality rates. Um, same thing goes for infant mortality rates. Um, and unfortunately, these, these numbers, these statistics haven't changed over the last 60 years. And we have to ask ourselves why and also when um, is, is the time going to come for us to address these things. Um, and so, you know, I think it was an opportunity to think differently about how access looks different, you know, for these mothers. How can they be supported in a way that they aren't currently being supported um, in the hospitals? Um, a lot of women are not feeling listened to, whether that's, you know, while they're pregnant or just when they're going for regular visits. Um, for some reason, doctors, they don't feel, um, they don't feel the need to, to validate, you know, Black women's voices in the hospital rooms, that they don't know what's going on with their own bodies, that for some reason, um, they don't know when they're in pain or there's discomfort or something, you know, in their body that doesn't um, feel right. And so, just as we think about access to health care, I think for our mothers um, that are experiencing these negative uh, outcomes and experiences in the hospital, um, you know, I see it as an opportunity for us to look at other ways that we can support them um, through community outreach, through getting in community first and kind of hearing like, what are you experiencing when you go to the hospitals um, and what resources, you know, have been helpful kind of since you've had those experiences if you've been able to come in contact with additional um, resources. And so, um, you know, one of the things we've just been looking at really is, I guess the first step of looking into um, supporting mothers through lactation support. Um, we're really excited to be building that program out and just kind of more so seeing how we can expose our rural communities to um, that type of maternal health support. Um, because we know that not only are they, if they're lacking hospitals, they're obviously lacking other things. Um, there are other things that are very far out of reach for a lot of those rural communities in the East that may force them to travel um, all the way from Richmond County up to Durham or Chapel Hill where the top hospitals are. Um, and sometimes you don't always have the resources or the time to do that. And so we have to think about how does that affect people's outcomes, their lives, their health, their health outcomes. Um, so yeah, so that's just a little bit about kind of um, how we've seen to incorporate um, maternal health um, into our access to healthcare work. Um, and just also seeing that, um, you know, maternal health, women's health is a big component too. Um, it shouldn't just be limited to um, getting good health care just because you're pregnant, but it should just be, it should be getting good health care because you're human um, and you deserve to have the same access to health care that everybody else has. You know, I think it's vitally important for the North Carolina Black Alliance to have this commitment statement around access to health care and for us to land in this coordination of a program that actually focuses on a maternal health for outcomes for women. I think this election cycle, if we're seeing anything, we're seeing a dynamic allotment of women running for office. And historically in our political system, we've seen women be the backbone of political movements for centuries. And right now, uh, when you think about attacks uh, from our uh, government, from the police state, we've seen a number of protests um, at the outcry of murders of black men and community. Um, when you think about the school to prison pipeline, and then when you think about maternal health, the deck is stacked against our community. And what better way for us to engage residents and community and our elected officials than by talking about healthcare and Medicaid expansion from the standpoint of women's health. So really uh, powerful work that you're doing, Karita. Can you talk a little bit about what offerings you're providing in your department for uh, individuals that want to connect with you for elected officials or community leaders or for groups that are just trying to do this work dynamically in community and want assistance? Uh, what are some things that you're offering and how can uh, we connect with you outside of this virtual experience? So um, the first way I would say you can connect with us outside of this virtual experience is to um, stay in contact with North Carolina Black Alliance Communications because we have an environmental justice and healthcare summit um, being planned in the fall of 2022. 
um, where we're going to look at, you know, the the issues um, that our Black communities are experiencing with regards to health care, but also the impact of environmental injustices that are that they're experiencing. How are issues such as water contamination affecting the conditions that are sending people to hospitals that may not be able to even afford the care? Um, and how their environments are contributing to these negative health outcomes. Um, and what are the root causes? You know, why are some, um, some communities more likely to have or experiencing water contamination versus others? Um, and so really getting to the root of these issues, but also how we can move forward um, and just see um, not only what um, our communities are feeling and kind of what they want to see in their communities, but also um, elevating that up to our elected officials to kind of let them know like, hey, this is what folks are saying in community. It's what they're experiencing. Um, and, you know, we would like to see and we kind of at the General Assembly for their health outcomes to be to be positive so that they can live to see the change that um, we're not only doing in healthcare but also in our education and our criminal justice work um, because they're all connected but people need to be alive to see the effects and the impact of um, this advocacy. It's very good every single one of our issues um, from environmental racism uh, to education criminal justice reform all of our issues point back to healthcare. And I think one of the things that we can do the best as we work with our uh, elected officials on a state, on a local and on a federal level is really talk about um, the individuals that they're helping when they're fighting for healthcare to point out the opportunities that they can engage with Carita, uh, engage with our data in a way that's gonna be helpful. And I think when we talk about these issues, we don't talk about them in a vacuum. We talk about them in this collective understanding of all of these issues collectively through the democratic process we have to engage with if we wanna see better outcomes in our community. And I think the work that you're doing is groundbreaking. I'm excited to see what you're going to uh, do with us over the next few years. Uh, I'm excited about what it looks like for Medicaid expansion, even in this uh, upcoming uh, cycle of the General Assembly. And I'm uh, very thankful of your time uh, and look forward to all the good things that is gonna come from the Access to Healthcare program. Karita Giddings, our program coordinator, for access to healthcare in North Carolina Black Alliance. Thank you for attending your first actual virtual experience for the North Carolina Black Summit. I hope you're enjoying it. Thank you so much for having me. Um, always a pleasure to talk about these issues and connect with folks um, as we can advance and advocate for these issues in the Black community. Take care.